God desires no less than that we should all be saints. So be ready, my friends. The saints are coming alive. WTN, sharing the splendor of truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Michael J. McGivney, founder of the Knights of Columbus. My dearly beloved in Christ, this is the town where I was born, Waterbury, the parish where under Our Lady's mantle, I grew up in the faith. My parents lived here. They died here. I was once a parish priest here in Connecticut. Through your commitment to faith, to living God's call to holiness, you can make a substantial and enduring contribution to your parishes, communities, and by doing so, Catholic families will help build a better world. A saint keeps the vision of God's love and the call to serve one's neighbor bright and clear to the end. For God desires no less than that we should all be saints. Now, in this very place, some of the great saints of the church have returned. They are here to speak with you and to answer some of the most important questions of our time. So be ready, my friends. The saints are coming alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a saint in the house. An Italian Jesuit priest, bishop, cardinal, theologian, teacher, writer, and doctor of the church. This humble man of prayer, conscience, and wisdom was a defender of the church and a defender of the God-centered democratic state. He is known as the Prince of Apologists, Patron of Catechists, and Doctor of Church-State Relations. Please stand and welcome St. Robert Bellarmine.
Thank you very much. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you created us perfect in your likeness and image. For by the envy of the darkness, death came into the world. If we live by that darkness, we will surely perish. For we live by the light of your tabernacle. Send forth your light and lead us to your holy hill and to the light of your love and truth. By your word, your only begotten light of wisdom. Make us strong and persevering in our virtue. And by the light of your tabernacle, give us our everlasting hope. Amen. St. Robert Bellarmine, welcome. Thank you. I must admit to being intimidated by your nickname, the Hammer of the Heresies. <laughs> I don't relish getting hammered by you for my obvious theological weaknesses. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I might hammer your mistakes, but not you. For our God, who is truth, is also the same God who is charity. The period in which you lived was one of the most difficult in the history of the church. Attacked by the Protestant reformers, the church suffered tremendous losses in numbers, property, power, prestige. Whole nations abandoned Mother Church, rejected doctrine after doctrine, denied the validity of the sacramental system, and even eliminated the central worship of the church, the Mass. In such a period of controversy, though, when tempers were always high and personal attacks were constant, your work was known for the kindness and respect that you gave the reformers. Well, <laughs> thank you. We, we must pursue truth with charity. You know, at the root of the Protestant revolt was a rejection of the authority of the church, the orthodox interpretation of scriptures, and the importance of tradition. If the church hadn't responded, it would have been destroyed. Your classic work, Disputations on the Controversies of the Christian Faith, to this day, it's considered the most complete defense of the Catholic teaching. The disputations uh, were written in a spirit of unity, a spirit of debate according to the ancient order of chivalry, which recognized the unity of love and truth. A spirit which also retained an innate respect for the honor and dignity of one's adversary. A spirit of concord which sought to, to practice a common virtue, a joint pursuit of truth. Since the Protestant Reformation, we've lived with a deep division among Christians. Your writings constitute a major cornerstone of the Catholic Church's defense. I made it great efforts in my writing to make it clear that the mystical body of Christ is also the Roman Catholic Church. As St. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, you are the body of Christ, member for member. I'd like to explore with you the special role of Christ as head and the Holy Spirit as soul of the mystical body. First, what is the special function of Christ the head? <laughs> the head gives sense and movement to the other members, so Christ is the head because he freely gives life and movement, that is faith and charity, and all the virtues to the faithful members who compose his body. And although at times, and to a limited degree, he permits, or, or rather commits, to mere man the function of certain senses, like the sense of sight to teachers, of, uh, of speech to preachers, of uh, sight and smell and hearing to pastors, yet he always reserves to himself the faculty of giving life and motion, which is the special prerogative of the head of everybody. What is the role of the Holy Spirit as the heart or soul of the mystical body. The heart or soul, which is in the center of the body and which, although itself unseen, 
mysteriously nourishes the parts that are seen is the Holy Spirit. For he is not clothed with human flesh and thus made visible like the head, who is Christ our Lord. No, the Spirit of Christ is not visible to the human eye, and yet it is he who governs and feeds and keeps alive the body of Christ, which is the Catholic Church. What is Mary's role in the church in Christ's mystical body? The head of the Catholic Church is Jesus Christ, and Mary is the neck, which joins the head to its body, the heart of which is the Holy Spirit, Mary's spouse. Conceived immaculate in perfect conformity to his will, the Father has decreed that all the gifts and all the graces which proceed from Christ as the head should pass through his daughter Mary to the body of the Church. If the Church is the body with Christ the head, and the Holy Spirit, the heart, and Mary, the neck. What part of the body are the apostles, popes, bishops, and priests? Well, um, we are all accustomed to placing burdens on our shoulders. <laughs> and so also Christ has done by placing the burden of the church's government on the shoulders of the apostles and their priestly successors. It follows, therefore, as the fathers of the church keep reminding us that the Episcopal office is not so much a dignity as a heavy responsibility. Hence also the supreme pastor of souls on whom rests the heaviest burden of all appropriately calls himself the servant of the servants of God. The Holy Eucharist is the source and summit of the church's life. Yet, you had to defend the real presence from the attacks of John Calvin, who argued that the real presence was unnecessary. Yes, that's true. I believe that the basis of Calvin's argument was that when a child is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we don't say that the Holy Trinity is in the water. Likewise, Christ, who is God, does not have to be present in the Eucharist to give us grace. So, why concoct the real presence to produce a grace that Christ can bestow without being present? If we measured God's goodness by what he had to do, none of us would exist. God did not have to become man. He could have redeemed the world without becoming man simply by an act of the divine will, but God chose to become incarnate, to suffer and die for our salvation. The least act of Christ's human will would have been enough to save a thousand worlds. Calvin's problem was that he did not realize how much God loves us. Why is that? since it is recorded in the scriptures that Jesus said, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him. Then who is John Calvin to contradict the Son of God? More than 200 years before the Declaration of Independence, you wrote extensively on the authentic sources of church-state power. I was really flabbergasted when I read your writings. They read like a summary of the collective vision of America's founding fathers. I presume from what I was taught in school that the founding fathers' ideas began with Aristotle and ancient Greece and Rome and finally came down to us through the philosophies of Algernon, Sidney, and John Locke, etc. Et Are you telling me that your schools have been rewriting history instead of teaching it? <laughs> if so, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, but I'm a dwarf standing on the shoulders of a giant on such matters. As the footnotes of my work demonstrate, you know, much of what I wrote was drawn from St. Thomas Aquinas, who lived 200 years before me. Today, our republic's roots in God are being challenged by the secularists, especially by the ideologues of socialism and communism. As for the church's application of its church-state teachings to the tyranny of socialism, I suggest, and I believe you would agree, 
that the folks read Pope Leo XIII's prophetic 1878 encyclical on socialism. I agree, absolutely. I recently discovered Father John Rager's book, Democracy and Bellarmine. You know, it offered me convincing proof of your influence on Thomas Jefferson and George Mason, particularly on the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the Declaration of Independence itself. How, how so? Well, Father Rager cites the fact that a book entitled Patriarcha by Protestant theologian Robert Filmer, who was the court theologian to King James I, was found in Thomas Jefferson's personal library at Monticello. Although Filmer sought to defend the divine right of kings, and in doing so sought to discredit and even refute your writings, he nevertheless quoted heavily from you. Key phrases of yours, many that were notated and underlined in the book, appear to have found their way into the Virginia Declaration of Rights by George Mason and the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> well, that's really fascinating. The Declaration of Independence is a beautifully clear expression of the American mind but it must be seen to be at the same time an accurate expression of the Catholic mind, medieval and modern. I'd like to demonstrate this to our audience, to quote some lines from the Declaration and ask you to quote a parallel line from your work. And also, if you can offer something in support from Thomas Aquinas, it would help immensely. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll do my best to point out the sources as well. Um, if I don't say otherwise, they'll be from, from my work entitled On the Laity, chapter six and seven. Okay. On the ultimate source of political power, the Declaration of Independence states, and we all know these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, is added. Uh, I, I stated in my work, the political power emanates from God, government, was introduced by divine law. And Aquinas uh, states, um, and I quote, God instructs us by means of his law and assists us by his grace. Political power is divinely initiated. Even St. Paul proclaims this, all power comes from God, which transforms what otherwise would be brute power into just power, creates the public person with unique attributes. End quote. As to the equality of man, the Declaration of Independence states that all men are created equal. That one's easy. I said all men are equal. <laughs> uh, not in wisdom or grace, but in the essence and nature of mankind. There is no reason why among equals one should rule rather than another. Political right is immediately from God and necessarily inherent in the nature of man. And in the, uh, the Principles of Office, chapter 22, I wrote, let rulers remember that they preside over men who are of the same nature as they themselves. St. Thomas, in his second sentences, said, nature made all men equal in liberty, though not in their natural perfections. On the source of governmental power, the Declaration of Independence states, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I wrote, depends upon the consent of the multitude to constitute over itself a king, consul, or other magistrate. This power is indeed from God, but vested in a particular ruler by the council and election of men. And in On the Clergy, I wrote, 
the people themselves immediately and directly hold the political power. And St. Thomas wrote, Therefore the making of a law belongs either to the whole people or to a public personage who has care of the whole people. The ruler has power and eminence from the subjects, and in the event of his despising them, he sometimes loses both power and position. I'm sure that most people today would assume that in your time, that the prevailing form of government, the monarchy, was divinely protected, <laughs> absolute. Are they wrong? I contended that the best form of government was actually a combination of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And the church supported me in this. Though you know, perhaps not popular at the time, like much of the church's teachings today, I defended these principles which now you consider to be the principles upon which your republic was founded. You know, the monarchy being paralleled by your presidency, the aristocracy being paralleled by your senate, which your founding fathers established originally as an appointed body based on life merit, and then finally, the democracy paralleled by your directly elected House of Representatives, and then later by the constitutional amendment by which uh, you directly elect your Senate. In your book, On the Laity, you spoke about a separation of powers in governance. Yes. I wrote, it depends upon the consent of men to place over themselves a king, council, and magistrate. That certainly reminds me of the separation of powers reflected in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Well, I, I saw that the danger in a monarchy ruling by divine right was despotism. The danger of a pure democracy was mob rule and aristocracy's danger to be elitism, while the danger of a mere judiciary to be a narrow legalism that undermines the spirit of mercy. These powers need to work in concert, not in isolation. Could you describe your role in the Galileo affair? I was only involved with the case in its early years, and not during the more serious period which you know, occurred after my death. Uh, Galileo was never enjoined by the church or by me from teaching Copernicanism or heliocentrism in particular. The church's position and mine was that Scripture speaks literally and figuratively, and that when a truth is solidly demonstrated by science, care must be taken to interpret Scripture only in accordance with it. My only recommendation to Galileo, which I made through his friend Foscarini, was that when a yet unproven scientific theory is in seeming contradiction, even with the literal level, that it be taught as a hypothesis until it was solidly demonstrated. That was Pope Urban VIII's position. So how did the crisis come about? Mm. Regrettably, after Galileo published his book, Dialogues Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, he insisted on moving his theory onto theological grounds, insisting certain scriptural statements to be completely in error because of his scientific findings. Thus, he was condemned by the Inquisition for his doctrinal and theological error, not for his scientific error. Galileo being placed under house arrest was certainly unjust, <clears throat> but in no way impugns the infallibility of Catholic dogma. Heliocentrism was never declared a heresy by either ex cathedra pronouncement or ecumenical council decree. What conclusions did the study commissioned by Pope John Paul II come to? Good point. In 1979, Pope John Paul II commissioned a study on this celebrated case by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. The Academy concluded its studies with the release of an in-depth report in 1992. According to reports in the New York Times, and other progressivist conduits of misinformation, that the study concluded that the Holy See was finally throwing in the towel and admitting that the earth revolves around the sun. 
In this perspective, the Galileo case was the symbol of the church's supposed rejection of scientific progress. Not so. That particular debate, so far as the, the church was concerned, had been closed since at least 1741, when Benedict XIV, he bid the Holy Office grant an imprimatur of the first edition of the complete works of Galileo. What John Paul II wanted to heal was this tragic split between the faith and science, which occurred in the 17th century, and from which Western culture has not recovered. So what was the true basis of the conflict and misunderstanding? Mm. Galileo's run-in with the church, according to the Pope, involved a tragic mutual incomprehension. It was a conflict that, that ought never to have occurred because faith and science, and this is important, properly understood, can never be at odds. There was a general confusion regarding science and philosophy in the 17th century. Galileo was not condemned for his science. He was condemned for his theology. The Holy Father said, and I quote, like the majority of his adversaries, Galileo did not make a distinction between what is the scientific focus of the natural phenomena and the philosophical considerations about nature that generally follows it. Though Pope John Paul offered an apology for his misunderstanding of certain churchmen, there was no solemn glorification of Galileo by the Pope. In reality, in reality, the Pope killed the myth. It was the myth's swan song. It, it, it did so ironically at the exact moment when as a result of the new physics, science is recognizing the fact that it does not, in fact, have all the truths and that theirs are absolute and undisputable. The last thing I want to say, though, is this. When we appeal to the throne of grace, we do so through Mary, honoring God by honoring His mother, imitating Him by exalting her, touching the most responsive chord in the sacred heart of Christ, with the sweet name of Mary. <laughs> Goodbye. God bless. And don't forget to pray for the souls in purgatory. Those in our church suffering, may the Lord of the Eucharist bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you.
anyone want a glimpse of the mystery? I do, I do, I do. Does anyone ever struggle with darkness? Does anyone want to turn on the light? Does anyone have a hunger for goodness? I do. Does anyone here believe in the spirit? Does anyone feel its powerful wave? Does anyone want to flow with the universe? I do, I do, I do. Does anyone want to lighten their heavy heart? Does anyone want to heal their soul? Does anyone here want to know Jesus? I do, I do, I do I do, I do, I do Yes, I do Burn